expression. Um, Southern Texas, okay, you're excused. <laughs> but the point is, whatever we're looking for and trying to find, it's obviously right there, but we overlook it. We can't see it. And I thought that, you know, Jesus faced the very same thing with his disciples. Now, not that they lost things, maybe they did, I don't know, but they could not see what was happening right there in front of them. They didn't notice it. They lived with Jesus for three years, and Jesus had taught and taught repeatedly and ex explained basically the same thing over and over again. He, he 
explained about the kingdom and salvation. And he tried to explain it in different ways that would help them understand. But still, they overlooked the point. They focused on the wrong things. And I think, honestly, we as his church have been struggling with the same problem. It's a big issue, an important issue that is right here, but we focus at, on something else. We don't recognize or see what is happening right there. We just continue to proceed through life and think of our priorities and our families and our jobs and our community <coughs> relationships, and we overlook the most important focus for his church, which is our souls. People's eternal life. Now, think about your life right now. Think about your week or your daily activities, what you've done over the past month. For example, we get up in the morning or we arrive home at night and we see our neighbors. And maybe we don't know our neighbors very well. Some of us probably know them well, others don't, but we tend to wave to our neighbors. Or we go to work. And every day we spend half of our day, our, our waking time, a third of our day, half of our waking time, with these people every day. And our children's friends come over to the house and they're playing or studying or doing whatever. And then we go and we watch our children's sports with friends there, with other people there that we see, the other parents. And all of those people, our children's friends, the other parents who are watching the game, our neighbor, or the, our family, our coworkers, all of those people, do you realize God created all of those people for his glory? Do you realize that? He created all of those people to worship him and give him praise. But most of those people have no clue as to why they are here on earth. Do you realize that? Most people here on earth have no idea why they are here. Oh, yeah, they have an agenda and a schedule, and they have their own priorities and goals for life. But do they really know the purpose that God intends for them? They have no idea. People who don't understand that God sent their Savior, Jesus Christ, into this world for them, People who without Jesus in their life will go to hell for eternity. <coughs> and those people are right here. Right here. We see them in our lives every day. And we overlook them. We don't see them. Oh, well, we see them. We see them with our eyes. But we don't see them with our hearts. be honest with you, sometimes at night I wonder, what is wrong with me? Where is my concern? Where is my compassion for those who are lost? Meaning that they have no God. They have no hope. And I ask myself sometimes, Lord, do I really care? I mean, I know the right answer. Yes, Lord, I care about those people. But when I really look at myself, do I really care? Well, okay, financially, materially, intellectually, and emotionally, these people are fine. The people that we have in our lives are fine. They get up, they go to work every day, they raise their families, they earn a living, they buy a house. And to look at them, they seem fine. 
they're comfortable. But do I really see them as Jesus sees them? I mean, I've spent time with those people. Sometimes I've spent an entire day with them. Not just once, not just one time, but it makes me think, you know, what about their souls? I haven't spent any time thinking about their souls. I don't say anything to them day after day, week after week, month after month. I haven't prayed for their souls yet, not once. So I guess I'm a little relieved because what scripture shows me, it tells me that I'm not alone. Because Jesus faced the very same problem with his disciples. Look at John chapter 4, verse 35. Jesus says, I tell you, open your eyes. Look at the fields, meaning, look at all of those people. They are ripe. They are ready right now. They are ready right now. The disciples couldn't see what Jesus saw. They couldn't understand what Jesus understood. And if we're honest, maybe we don't want to see like Jesus. Because we're busy. I mean, life is busy, right? We are focused on our comfortable life, on our relationships, on what we have, on who we know right now. But the question, this present life, your daily life, is that all that we have? We're born, we grow up, we live, we die, that's it? No, it's not. Jesus says, wake up, look. <coughs> we need his help to focus on him, to help us spiritually see what is right there in front of us. There are people right there in our lives every day. <laughs> Now, let's back up for a moment. In John chapter 4, it's a wonderful incident that happened with Jesus here. And I don't have time to get into the entire passage, but you can read John chapter 4. Uh, Jesus had met a Sumerian woman. Well, anyway, what had happened, Jesus had been traveling on his ministry. He had been in Judea, and he'd been teaching and healing, and many people repented. Many people received Jesus Christ. Many people became saved because of his powerful ministry. We would call that, you know, a successful ministry now. But the point is that many people were saved through Christ and what was happening. But for several reasons, Jesus knew that he was finished in Judea and he needed to go back to Galilee. So Jesus and his disciples traveled. And when they got to Samaria, now the Jews would tend to go around Samaria. They wouldn't go through Samaria. Because it just wasn't proper for Jews to do that. They would avoid Samaria. And the history between the Jews and the Sumerians there in verse 9, you notice that they did not interact at all. They had a long history there of feuding. Well, anyway, Jesus, with his disciples, decided that they would stop and rest. The disciples went to find food, and they left Jesus there. So Jesus was sitting and waiting. And he spied a Sumerian woman there. 
So he intentionally started talking with her. And this woman then realized who Jesus was. This is the Messiah. So she ran back to town and she called the people. They said, you know, come and see this man who knows everything about me. Okay? So the townspeople decided that they would come and see who this Messiah was. So that throng of people that came, Jesus said in verse 35, Disciples, take a look. This throng of people coming towards you, those people are those fields. They are ready right now. Okay, so can you envision what's happening here? So, the next time you go to a football game, or the next time you go to a volleyball match, or the next time you're in downtown Frederick, take a look around, see who is there. I mean, who is there? Is it just people? Strangers? Maybe with friends or relatives or neighbors? Or, okay, maybe they're deaf or they're hearing or you notice their race. Or, will you see who Jesus sees, meaning people that God created for his pleasure, people who need God's grace through Jesus Christ, people who need salvation, people just like you. It's interesting. We have become saved. And the moment we become saved, we realize, Lord God, you have blessed me. I am now saved. My joy is never ending. But then what happens over time? That starts to fade. That enthusiasm, that zeal, <coughs> that anticipation, that feeling of, I must tell people. I have to share what has happened to me. It changed my life. But over time, that fades, and we fall into our regular daily schedule. So when we look out there, and we see all of those people, do we see people ready now? Or do we just see all of these people and let it go right on by us? That's an important question for us. Who do we see? We're talking about what the Bible calls evangelism. You know, we see that word within the New Testament 52 times. So I'm assuming that means it's important. 52 different times there. So really, it means teaching, sharing, explaining the gospel. God's message, his good news that will save us. Now, next week we'll delve into some specifics about what exactly the gospel is or what it is not. But this morning, my hope is that when we share the gospel, we hope and pray that they will listen and that we will convince them, persuade them that they need to be saved. But already I can see or I can imagine the anxiety that this word causes people. You start to sweat. It causes <laughs> people's hearts to race. It causes them to feel nauseous. Oh my gosh, I've got to sit down and share. I don't have that gift. I don't know how to say this. I don't know what to say. Suppose they ask me a question and I can't answer it. 
Well, you're right. <coughs> but I want you to notice this morning, before Jesus tells the disciples, go and evangelize, before you say anything, he tells them to do what? Look. Open your eyes. Open your hearts. See and recognize their pain. See and recognize their discouragement. See and recognize people looking and looking for something to meet their needs because what they have now isn't working. See and recognize people out there who can't even recognize that they need God. Can we see, can we recognize that there are people out there who don't even realize God, God? Do we have people like that? I wonder, do we really believe that people need the Lord? Oh yes, we will say, oh yes, you should go to church. You should read the Bible. It's good for you. I'm encouraging you to try it. But do we really <coughs> believe that people need and require the Lord? I just read some research that showed one of the biggest reasons that Christians tend to avoid evangelism or sharing the gospel. The biggest reason they avoid this not because they're afraid, no. The number one reason, the biggest reason is we don't believe that people need <coughs> Jesus. I mean believe. Oh, well, it's great for me. Maybe you should try it. Maybe. Try it, which means maybe not. Do whatever you want. Well, Jesus disagrees. I'll show you the next slide. Jesus was very clear. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way. The way to where? The way to God. And I think we tend to forget that. I am the way. The way to God. And if you can't find the way, that means that you are lost. If you can't find a way, that means you were lost. Yesterday, I was driving to Calvert County, Maryland. Do you know where Calvert County, Maryland is? It's in Southern Maryland, and I was driving, and I arrived at the water. I was driving, but I actually depended on GPS. I had no clue, plus with the rain, that really made it worse too. Just praying, Lord, please, please let this JP, G, GPS continue to work. Honestly, I had no idea where I was going. Do we really believe that without Jesus, people are lost, meaning they can't find God? That's important. Do you really believe that Jesus is the only way? That's a basic truth of the Bible. That is a basic truth of the Bible. And if you are struggling with that concept that Jesus is the only way, then you need to resolve that question for yourself. Because your eternal life depends on the answer. People need Jesus. He is the only way to heaven. The second reason people tend to avoid evangelizing 
it requires prayer. And honestly, we don't pray very much. Oh, we pray for our needs. When a problem arises, then we'll pray. But specific prayers for people's souls? No, we don't tend to do that. We pray, do we pray for opportunities to share Jesus with people? Uh, no. And why not? Because suppose it does really happen. Suppose the Lord places a person right there in front of us right now. We wonder, what am I going to say? How am I supposed to respond? I'm not sure I better pray for that because maybe God really will put a person in front of me. Then I'm done. Pray. Ask the Lord to open your heart. Ask the Lord for an opportunity, and it will happen. But the Lord won't just leave you on your own and say, good luck with that. No, he'll be there to help you. But again, first, can we see their need? Suppose your family member or a friend dies tomorrow. I know you don't like to dwell on that thought. We don't want to think about people dying. But it's a fact. 150,000 people die every day. 150,000 people die every day and face eternity <coughs> every day. 150,000 people. Will they go to heaven? or hell every day. And of course we grieve because they're gone. We were with them, really good friends, and now they're gone. There's a big hole left in our hearts. But I wonder, do we grieve for their souls? Do we grieve because they did not know Jesus Christ? Do we grieve because their entire life that person was chasing after the wrong dream? Or they were chasing more things or chasing better things? And it's all <coughs> pointless. It means nothing. So do we grieve for that? We grieve because now they are suffering for eternity in hell. Oh, I don't like to think that's a, it's an awful thought. Pastor, why did you bring that up? We have to because of their souls. They face eternity. Pray for their souls. Pray for an opportunity. There's one more reason we tend to avoid evangelism. It's countercultural. And what exactly does that mean? When you share your story about Jesus with a family member or a friend or a coworker, the culture out there may feel awkward, may feel uncomfortable. So what are you to do? Are you not to say anything because of that? <clears throat> Do you say nothing because of fear? Suppose somebody challenges me. Suppose they reject me. Well, I agree. <coughs> the culture will not accept that Jesus is the only way. The culture will not accept that. So does that mean that we never say that? No, except that fact. The culture out there in general will not accept Jesus as the only way, but your friend might, your family member might, 
<clears throat> Your sister's husband might. So the question is, is their eternal life worth the risk? Is it worth saying something to them? If you had the cure for cancer, you found the cure, wouldn't you share it? Of course you would. How many people that <laughs> you know have struggled with cancer throughout the years? Oh, the list is long. Family, friends, co-workers. Well, you and I have the cure for death. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ heals death. Are you going to share it? Now, over the next several weeks, over the next four or five weeks, we will study what to share, how to share it, the gospel itself, what it means exactly, and we will study how God can use us to reach out to other people. And I want to emphasize this God and his role, because God alone convicts people's heart. He alone convicts them of their sin. We can't. God alone causes people to repent. We can't cause people to repent. God alone draws people in through the Holy <coughs> Spirit. We can't. Oh, I could teach you the best techniques and methods as to what to say and how to say it, and you would speak so eloquently that it would convince this person. But the problem is, if God has not yet called that person, then all of your words and all of your actions, all of your attempts are worthless. So does that mean that I don't have a role in this? No, we do have a role. We can become partners in the gospel with the Lord we are what are called witnesses. We become God's witnesses to declare to the world what has happened, what God has done within our lives, and what he has done here in the world through creation, and what he has done, how he reigns. But also to let the world know that they must seek God, they must repent, and they must become saved. It's not enough just to say, oh, God is great. He's changed my life. I mean, I'm getting better every day. Well, yes, that's true. But it's not the full story. We must seek God. We must repent from sin to become saved. And the question is, Will we allow his spirit to guide us? Will we trust his spirit? Will we say, yes, Lord, I'm afraid, I'm anxious, but I trust you? Or will we allow fear to guide us? I'm telling you, there are people out there who are ready right now your family, your friends, your co-workers, the community, the school, the neighbors, they need Jesus. Do you realize that if we don't introduce them to Jesus, who will? And 
And then we will close with this. Holy Spirit, we pray now that you will open our eyes and our hearts. Help us to see what is possible, not through our own actions, but instead through your work, through us, through your people. I pray, Lord, that where we feel anxious or doubtful, that you will replace that with confidence and joy and peace. We lift up all in your precious name. Amen. Thank you.